Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire. A biography of Muhammad Ali Jinnah recently published has shattered two of the most cherished beliefs about the founder of Pakistan. First, that the Lahore Resolution of 1940 was a bargaining chip intended to secure greater political influence for Muslims in a united country and not to divide India. And secondly, that the August 14th, 1947 speech to the Pakistan Constituent Assembly is proof that Jinnah wanted Pakistan to be a secular state. And here is the book. It's called Jinnah, His Successes, Failures, and Role in History. Its author is Professor Ishtiaq Ahmed, a emeritus professor of political science at Stockholm, a former visiting professor at Government College Lahore, as well as the Lahore University of Management Sciences. And today, Professor joins me live from Stockholm. Professor Ahmed, as I said in that introduction, your book is full of fascinating revelations and insights about Jinnah, but today I want to primarily concentrate on two of them. First, the interpretation initially popularized by Aisha Jalal, but then accepted by many, that Jinnah's call for partition was not actually intended to divide the country, but to secure greater political role for Muslims in a united India. Your, your book provides a wealth of evidence to debunk this viewpoint. I'll come to that evidence in a moment's time. But first, in your book, you say of both Jinnah and Aisha Jalal, and I'm quoting, Jinnah never, even once, showed any interest in a united India and in a power-sharing deal with Hindus and Muslims as equal nations sharing power at the center. And then you add, Jalal amidst all those speeches, statements, and messages where ad infinitum, Jinnah reiterates that the Lahore resolution means the division of India into Hindustan and Pakistan. So you're saying that Aisha Jalal has deliberately ignored all the evidence that contradicts her viewpoint. Yes, this, that is exactly what I mean. It is amazing when, you know, she has been interviewed in Pakistan by many, uh, you know, people, and they have wanted her and me to come in the same show. And she refuses, saying that she will not entertain me because I am not a historian. I am a political scientist. And then she alleges that I first generate a theory and then look for facts. My answer to her then is, in her case, however, she has the unique gift of being able to write history without facts. That is a feat I think no historian, historian has ever achieved. She could not give even a single statement of Muhammad Ali Jinnah ever even obliquely suggesting that he would like to share power in a united India between, uh, on the basis of Hindus and Muslims being an equal nation. After the 22nd of March 1940, I would like even one statement, speech, message of Jinnah to be quoted. She can't. Let's then come at that point, Professor Ahmed, to the enormous evidence that you provide in your book to debunk the view that the Lahore Resolution was simply a bargaining chip, that the call for Pakistan was just a bargaining chip. First, Jinnah himself, on several occasions, you say, actually denied this. On the 23rd of November 1940, he said, it's not a counter for bargaining. On the 2nd of March 1941, he said, Pakistan is a matter of life and death to the Muslims, and it is not a counter for bargaining. And then again, on the 3rd of April 1942, he said, our firm determination and our only goal is one. Pakistan, Pakistan, Pakistan. So if Jinnah himself repeatedly denied this, how did this theory end up getting so much credibility? Now, that's the million dollar question. It is most intriguing. The explanation is not academic, but let me give you a multi-layered explanation why this has happened. First of all, reputable historians, both in India and Pakistan, do not accept her theory at all. If you come to the Pakistani side, there is a whole 
a studies program called Pakistan Studies, where the main historians have contributed. And they argue that Jinnah single-handedly withstood the pressure of, of Congress, which was both carrot and stick, and, and won Pakistan against all odds. So, but these people are local historians who do not have the networking with Western European universities. So that's one reason that although it has been challenged, that has not been heard of beyond those academic circles. The second is, of course, Karan, you and I know that there is a colonial mentality which pervades our intellectual milieu. You know, a, a PhD thesis passed by Cambridge University is like divine revelation dis descending from heavens. And one has to submit to it without questioning. Finally, Aisha Jalal at Harvard and the link to Cambridge means that she and her associates operate like a, a gatekeepers without whose uh, you know, willingness, no literature can be presented uh, at those universities. So it's mostly in the Western universities that this reputation of her thesis still continues to have a following. But now, when, we come, when we come to our own region, there are very good political explanations. And let me, I, I, let me uh, tell you what I think. In India, among people who want to blame the Congress party for not accommodating Muslim communal interest and thus preventing the partition. This is, this is one group of people who think that the Congress parties, especially Nehru's militant secularism could not accommodate Muslim communal interest. And ironically in Pakistan, among the so-called liberal left, the allegation is just in the opposite direction mm -hmm. that behind Nehru's secular facade lurked majoritarian Hindu communalism and dynastic ambitions. I understand. While, Let's not get lost on this point because it's only a peripheral point, but you're saying A, the reputation Aisha Jalal has because of her Cambridge and Harvard connections have meant that right. few people have been able to challenge her viewpoint. And secondly, for political reasons, both in India and in Pakistan, mm -hmm. Although right, the right. reasons may be different, but there has been a vested interest in wanting to accept her thesis. Absolutely. Now, in Absolutely. fact, in your book, you go one step further. You write, and I'm quoting you, Jinnah never hinted even obliquely that he was prepared to agree to a power sharing deal with the Congress. And in fact, at one point in your book, you say, and I'm quoting, Jinnah was obsessed with having India partition. This suggests, to use a colloquialism, that Jinnah was hell-bent on partition. Absolutely hell-bent. His whole genius as a lawyer was to prove to, you know, the British and Muslims and Hindus, the three groups, that under no circumstance can Hindus and Muslims live peacefully as one nation. Uh, and so the only way to create peace is to divide India and, and that means partition. He even went forward with more radical ideas about the balkanization of India. I'll come to those in a moment's time. Let's go through these step by step. You make okay. one other very important point in your book. You show that Jinnah was actually unconcerned about what would be the fate of Muslims left behind in India if partition happened. In fact, yes. he thought of those Muslims who would get left behind in India as a necessary sacrifice. Referring to the speech he made in Kanpur on the 30th of March, 1941, you write, and I'm quoting, in order to liberate seven crore Muslims where they were in a majority, he was willing to perform the last ceremony of martyrdom if necessary and let the two crore of Muslims who would be left in India get smashed. In other words, he really didn't care about what happened to Muslims who were going to be left in India. Absolutely not. The, he couldn't care at all uh, because, you know, this was the major question the people at Kanpur put to him. 
that the 1940 resolution envisages Pakistan in areas where there was already a Pakistan. All the chief ministers in northwestern and northeastern India were Muslims. It's only the Muslim minority which would be left in the Hindu majority provinces who would then have to face uh, aggressive Hindu nationalism. Maulana Abul Kalam Azad among Muslims was saying this. Maulana uh, uh, Hussain Ahmed Madni is on record of the jamiyat e ulma hind saying the same, but he wouldn't give a damn. But may I just point out that once Pakistan came into being, he had a message conveyed to Nehru that please do not uh, take over my palatial house in Malabar, on Malabar Hill. I want to retain its property and I want it to be rented out to Europeans and not native Indians. And the, <laughs> and the monthly rent he claimed is rupees 3000. In a forthcoming book, I'm bringing forth this, bringing forth this information as well. So this there's is a very complete- this is very interesting. Jinnah was unconcerned, in fact, perhaps yes. cold and brutal about what would happen to Muslims left behind in India. He saw them as a necessary sacrifice. But after becoming governor general of Pakistan, he wrote to Nehru to say, please look after my property in Malabar Hill. I want it rented. I want it given to Europeans, not to Indians or Muslims. And he specified the rent. In other words, his attitude to his property was very different to the indifference he showed to Muslims left behind in India. There's a stark contrast between the two. Karan, till 1947, he was looking for choice property in Lahore. He was obsessed with acquiring, buying property stocks. That's how his whole mentality worked. Okay. Now, I want to come at this point to the mention you made that, in fact, it wasn't just partition that Jinnah seemed to be keen on. You suggested a moment ago that he was, in fact, interested in the balkanization of India. And this comes out in your book when you reveal that Jinnah supported calls to establish Dravidistan. In other words, mm -hmm. a Dravidian independent country in South India. He was even supportive of calls to create a separate state, a separate country for Sikhs. At this point, it seems what you call his obsession with partition, that's your precise phrase, seems much more like an attempt to dismember India, to balkanize India. We cannot come to any other conclusion except this. And let me add to it that until August 1947, he's on record saying that unlike the Congress, the Muslim League will respect the 565 princely states remaining independent and sovereign. It's only in August when it became clear that India is going to merge the princely states in its territory that he changed his position in Pakistan. And on the 11th of August, 1947, when Kalat, for example, declared itself independent, Pakistan recognized it. But as soon as it was 14th of August and the power was transferred on the 15th, Kalat was put under great pressure. And then finally, on 1st April, Pakistani tanks moved into Kalat city and all opposition was crushed. So but that's the first. Back, but but, but yeah. to come back to the point that I'm concluding, when you say Jidda supported calls for Dravis to San, Dravidian, yes, 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 an independent yes. Dravidian state in South India, and he also supported calls for a separate Sikh state. Are you That's actually right. saying that it wasn't just partition, he wanted to dismember India? Is the word dismember he wanted, correct? He wanted to dismember India? Absolutely, there is no question. And I give evidence of not only uh, accepting Junagadh, you know, the Nawab acceding to Pakistan when Junagadh is well into Indian territory and there is no way it connects with Pakistan. And then I think uh, Jodhpur and Bikaner, the princes were thinking of not joining India and he flirted with them. And then in Hyderabad, he told the Nizam of Hyderabad, you should be ready to sacrifice yourself like Imam Hussain. 
and never join India. I mean, this is all on record. In the book, I give all the evidence. In fact, in the book, you make one further point that is quite important. You say Jinnah wanted to get as much territory as possible out of India and incorporated into Pakistan. So he, even, so he even wooed Hindu majority princely states. You write, and I'm quoting you, he tried to woo even Hindu majority princely states ruled by Hindu Maharajas to join Pakistan. And you add yeah. such an irrational approach derived from his basic political goal to bring about the division of India and get as much territory as possible out of India for Pakistan. Not only that, Karan, he took a stand on Bengal and Punjab saying that they must be given as a whole to Pakistan. When the opposition, you know, already in 1940, when this idea of dividing India was presented in Lahore, uh, Sardar Sundar Singh Majithia of the Sikh Nationalist Party is on record saying that if the Muslims want, want India be to be divided on the basis of religion, we will ensure that those parts of Punjab which have a Hindu Sikh majority are taken away and given either to a Sikh state or to India. And then later on, it's only on the 8th of March 1947 that the Congress party finally supported the Sikh demand for the partition of Bengal. Absolutely. And but let's not, let's not get lost in detail. Let's stick to the okay. big picture because the big picture illustrates the point you're making. Okay. You're now creating an impression for the audience in India yeah. that A, Aisha Jalal's interpretation that the Lahore resolutions called for partition was just a bargaining chip, a bargaining chip to procure greater political influence for Muslims in the United Country. That interpretation is wrong. In fact, secondly, you're saying not only was Jinnah, to use your words, obsessed with partition, but actually, beyond that, his aim was to absolutely dismember India. He stood for Dravidistan, for a separate Sikh state. He was even trying to woo Hindu majority states with Hindu princes to join Pakistan. In other words, balkanization and dismemberment were his intention. Absolutely. And if you look at the evidence I, I uh, provide in the book, there is no other conclusion you can draw. The, the thing is that Aisha Jalal has completely suppressed such evidence and, and presented a view of Jinnah which has no basis in, in reality, in the facts. And she does it without providing any proof. What she does is a mind reading. Finally, and perhaps mm. this, in a sense, makes the interpretation that you're debunking today seem so bizarre because it's impossible to believe that the Lahore resolution of 23rd March 1940 was a bargaining chip. If you pay attention to what Jinnah said in his speech just one day earlier on the 22nd, I'm exactly from that speech. You've published the entire speech in your book. This is what Jinnah says in that speech. It's a dream that the Hindus and Muslims can ever evolve a common nationality. They belong to two different civilizations, which are based mainly on conflicting ideas and conceptions. Muslim India cannot accept any constitution which must necessarily result in a Hindu majority government. And then finally, and perhaps this is the clinching part of that speech, he says, Muslims are a nation according to any definition of nation, and they must have their homelands, their territory, and their state. Now, after that powerful sentence said one day earlier, it's hard to believe that a resolution passed 24 hours later could just be a bargaining chip. It seems to fly against what Jinnah himself is saying. But, you know, if you look at uh, Jalal's book, this speech is missing. And what is also missing is that on the 25th of March, when he gave a press conference in Lahore after the, after the session was over, he said the Lahore resolution is about the division of India. So there is absolutely no reason to assert 
that he wanted to use the Pakistan demand and this Lahore resolution as a bargaining chip. It is absurd. It is preposterous. In fact, the point you made earlier that people in India have accepted Aisha Jalal's interpretation that the Lahore resolution was just a bargaining chip for political reasons. In other words, yes, they yes. wanted to blame the Nehru's and Jawaharlal in particular for being an obstacle is a viewpoint right. that was endorsed by just one thing. He was a former BJP finance minister, former BJP foreign minister, former BJP defense minister. And he wrote a biography of Jinnah in 2009 where he too takes the line that the Lahore resolution was a bargaining chip, that it was the intransigence of Congress and perhaps Nehru in particular that pushed Jinnah to partition. Partition yes, was not his intention. So all of that, as far as your view is concerned, falls into place. Aisha Jalal simply didn't look at the evidence that contradicts her viewpoint. And secondly, she, 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 she must have known the, that there was evidence. She could not present it and then claim that you know, didn't want uh, India partition and all. She, so you're saying she suppressed, suppressed it. it. She suppressed, suppressed it. it. Suppressed it. And people like Jaswan Singh followed the same view because yeah, because he's not a historian. He, I mean, people when reputable, I mean, historians from Cambridge or whatever, right? People accept in good faith that this must be true. And for just one thing, it was also convenient because it provided a means of legitimately blaming Congress and Nehru rather, than, rather than laying the blame on Jinnah. Okay, let's then move at this point to the second big reinterpretation contained in your book. This time, okay. it's to do with Jinnah's famous speech of August 11, 1947, delivered to Pakistan's Constituent Assembly just three days before Pakistan itself was born. Now, this speech has been widely interpreted to mean that Jinnah wanted Pakistan to be a secular state. You completely disagree. You say Jinnah's intention in making that speech was narrow and strategic. And I'm going to quote you. You say, it is imperative to underline that its primary aim and purpose was to convince the Indian government that the minorities, i.e. mainly Muslims, would be safe and have equal rights in Pakistan with a view to convincing the Indian government not to expel the 35 million Muslims who were to remain in India. What you say was Jinnah's prime concern was a fear that if the impression gains ground in India, right, that minorities in Pakistan are being badly treated, i.e. Hindus in Pakistan and Sikhs in Pakistan are being badly treated, then something similar could happen to the Muslims who remain in India and they would flood across the border. Pakistan would not be able to handle that. A new poor country with a poor administration would be overwhelmed. That is what he wanted to avoid when he made that speech of 11 August. He wasn't committing Pakistan to a secular future. He was simply saying, I'll treat your minorities well in this country. Please look after mine and yours. Don't let them cross the border. Am I right in that understanding? Can you spell it out further? You have summed it, have summed it up admirably, Karan. Let me just put it in perspective. You see, according to the partition plan, large portion, portions of minorities would have remained both in India and Pakistan. But insofar as West Pakistan is concerned, if all the Hindus and Sikhs had stayed on, they would be 21% of the total population of West Pakistan, which is today's Pakistan. By December 1947, all of them almost had run away, mostly to save their lives. Only 1.6% remained in interior Sindh. And to this day, the Hindu population of Pakistan remains 1.6%. Insofar as India is concerned, the Congress never had any such program of uh, uh, pushing Muslims out of India. And in 1947, those left behind were 9.8% of the population. Today, they are 14.2% of the population. Although in 1947, the Kashmir population and that of some other places, Muslim population were not included. But actually in India, that population has increased in India, in Pakistan. 
21% was reduced to 1.6% and that is where it remains. So the point you're making is Jinnah's great fear was that if Muslims left behind in India flood across the border into Pakistan, Pakistan, a new country with a poor administration and itself not resource rich would be overwhelmed. And so, the yes. speech, and so the speech was designed to protect Pakistan from being overwhelmed by a flood of refugee Muslims, not, not to commit Pakistan to being a secular state. No, not at all. Just to prevent Pakistan's total collapse. If so many people were pushed into India by uh, into Pakistan by India, he knew that the Congress Party never had such an ideology, and they wouldn't do it. And Gandhi and Nehru stood the ground and the Muslims remained in India. It's as simple as that. Now, you also hint in your book that there could be a second reason for that speech. It was made, as I said, at the inauguration of Pakistan's Constituent Assembly. And there were many foreign dignitaries sitting in front of Jinnah in the audience. And perhaps more importantly, Jinnah was very conscious of the fact that the world would be listening. Western leaders would be listening to his speech as the president of the Constituent Assembly. And you write, I'm quoting you, if omitting the words Islam, Quran, or Sharia, and instead projecting Pakistan in a secular light were worthwhile to please and assuage foreign powers, then Jinnah was possibly willing to do it. He wanted to be seen by foreign dignitaries as a leader of all Pakistanis and not just Muslims. In other words, this speech was also playing to the gallery. Absolutely to the gallery. How many of these foreign diplomats were actually in the gallery, I don't know. But there is no reason to doubt that Jinnah was now addressing the whole world and especially uh, addressing the United States of America, which he saw was the new leader of the Western world. You see, the, uh, the United States of America was skeptical about the creation of Pakistan and the, and the partition of India and till the very end opposed uh, the creation of Pakistan. In 1946, Jinnah had sent Mr. Isfahani, a very close associate of his, to go to the United States and plead with the Americans that we as a Muslim nation would be your frontline state, not only in South Asia, but also in the Middle East, where you have oil interests against Soviet communism. And so, but, in, this, so in this speech, Jinnah was yeah. also sending a message to America, right? Yes. To yes. Truman yes. in particular, who was president, of yes. his own sincerity and credibility, and of Pakistan's viability, and therefore the image and impression that mine will be a secular state suited Jinnah's purposes. Just for that moment, yes. Okay, you make one other very important point, Professor Ahmed. You point out that the word secular is missing from that speech. And you also add that if Jinnah had Ataturk's Turkish model in mind, he would have explicitly said so. But in fact, he doesn't yeah. refer to Ataturk and the Turkish model at all. And then no. again, you write, and I'm quoting, if Jinnah wanted Pakistan to emulate Turkey, he should have mentioned it explicitly. The term secularism is missing in his speech, and that too, you say, is a major omission if he wanted a conceptual transformation to take place. In other words, the fact that Jinnah doesn't use the term secular, doesn't refer to Turkey or Ataturk, makes it pretty clear that wasn't what he had in mind, because if it was in his mind, he would have said so. Because this was an example of a Muslim state which was secular. And he could have given it. It would have, would have been the most appropriate thing to do, but he does not. So the thing is, he had he, the whole Pakistan idea, the communal two-nation theory is anti-secular. It's anti-democratic. How could he then? I mean, he was stuck in that way of thinking. Absolutely. So, in other yeah, words, yeah. Jinnah's refusal to, word, to use the word secular and his total yes. silence about Ataturk and Turkey actually speak volumes. That silence speaks volumes. 
The thing is, people have said that in his 60 years of politics or 50 years of politics, he never ever used the word secular. So I think he had some antipathy to the, the very notion of secularism. Although, to be honest, it's widely known that he married a Parsi, not a Muslim, that he drank scotch, that he ate pork sandwiches, and he lived a very Western lifestyle. So maybe in his personal attributes, he might have been fairly secular, but clearly that doesn't mean he wanted Pakistan to be a secular state. Hitler was a vegetarian. Does that make him a very peaceful person? Would you accept a, a dietary explanation of how people fix their ideologies? These are... <laughs> and one thing more, Jinnah converted that Parsi lady to Islam. He went to a Sunni Malvi of Bombay, converted her, and then married her according to Shia Asna Shari rights. So the fact that a non-Muslim was converted is a plus thing from an okay. Islamic point okay. of view. And then, you know, Ghalib is famously quoted saying, I don't eat pork, but I eat, uh, uh, but I drink sharab. Jinnah Sahib went even further. <laughs> now, let's come back to your book at this point. Historians have said that Jinnah's speech was suppressed. And they've used the fact that his speech was suppressed as proof that Jinnah's successors did not want it to be known or at least remembered that Jinnah stood for a secular Pakistan. Again, you totally disagree with this. And I'm going to quote you. You say, to believe his speech was suppressed against his will is preposterous. More probable was that Jinnah and his advisors decided not to publicize it because it was meant primarily for the Indian government and leaders. And therefore, once yes. the speech was made, it had served its purpose. There was no room or role for it to be retained for posterity. Well, that's correct. Because uh, uh, what, what else can one conclude? I mean, there is no reason to doubt this. This is what he wanted to achieve with it. You have absolutely no doubt in your mind that that speech, which is widely interpreted as proof of Jinnah's secularism, and by the way, our own former Deputy Prime Minister Lal Krishna Advani, in praising Jinnah's secularism, cited this speech. You're saying this speech has been misunderstood. It was not his intention to make Pakistan a secular country. This was simply a way of convincing Indians, I'll treat Muslims and Sikhs well. Please don't let your Muslims flood across the border and overpower and my country, because otherwise my country will collapse. Let, let, me, give, let me give you another explanation. You see, from uh, the time Pakistan came into being till at least May 1948, Jinnah presided over all cabinet meetings, made all decisions on behalf of the, capital, of the cabinet. The Prime Minister, Liaquat Ali Khan, sat among the ministers and he tamely signed whatever Jinnah had approved. With so much authority being exercised by Jinnah, do you think he would let some bureaucrats suppress his speech against his will? It makes no sense. I'm sure they made the speech and said, well, its task is over. Now we have to deal with the Muslims uprooted in the millions, Pakistan gained in the name of Islam. So let's come to the reality of Pakistan and deal with it. Okay. And in fact, your conclusion, I'm going to cite it in a moment's time, couldn't be clearer. You say, what can most certainly be discarded as unfounded and unwarranted is that the two-nation theory and the demand for Pakistan was about a secular democratic Pakistan. In other words, given Jinnah's commitment to the two-nation theory, given his commitment to a separate Pakistan for Indian Muslims, it's impossible to believe he intended that to be a secular state. Let me also problematize this. If you look at how Pakistan was won, how Muslims, the amorphous Muslim community of India was mobilized to support Pakistan, the election campaign of 1945-46, which I've given in the book, is rapidly communal. Uh, the ulama, Brailvi ulama of northwestern India, the Muslim majority provinces, were given a free hand 
to project Pakistan as a as an Islamic panacea based on the values of the state of Medina. And Muslims were told that if they did not vote for Pakistan, their marriages would be annulled. Unke nikah wo, uh, cancel ho jayenge. And if they died, they would be refused an Islamic burial. And there are, you know, these posters uh, which were put up during the election campaign saying that on one hand is Jinnah and the Muslim League and on the other hand is Baldev Singh and uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, the last leader of the Punjab Unionist Party, uh, Hayat Khan, whatever his name, uh, Divana, giving Divana. vote. Divana. <laughs> Never mind. Board. Let's not get lost on that. Carry on. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, on one hand is uh, voting for the Holy Prophet. On the other hand, is voting for Kufristan. So these were the posters, and this is how they won the. Uh, and yeah. the point you're making is the what you call the rabidly communal atmosphere and sloganeering of that particular yes. election campaign just before yes. independence happened in 1946 is a yes. clear sign that in fact the country that would be created would not be secular. It's hard to believe that this sort of communal campaign could lead to the creation of a secular state. Let me then at this point make one little note for the audience. We're holding yes. our discussion on the 23rd of March 2022. This is not just Pakistan Day, Pakistan's National Day, but it is also the anniversary of the Lahore Resolution. That resolution was passed on the 23rd of March 1940. We are now roughly 82 years beyond. And I want to point it out, this is why this conversation today has relevance and meaning. But I'm going to now go beyond that. There are two other things in your book that I want to touch on, but very briefly. Yeah. First, your book says that after becoming governor general of an independent country, Jinnah had no clear or consistent vision or policies to offer. What you're saying now is that Jinnah may have created an independent country and made history and even geography in the process, but he did not have a vision for the future of the country he created. Absolutely. By the way, the name of that man is Malak Khizar Hayat Tiwana. So, I mean, I had forgotten the name. Absolutely. I mean, to the ulama and to the conservative Muslims, he gave a free hand to project it as an Islamic state. To the educated type of Muslims, he said, oh, you know, democracy is in our blood. 1300 years ago, uh, we were given a constitution which was very kind to the uh, 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 minorities to get care of them. Then also, you know, on the 14th of March, uh, 14th of August, when actually the Constituent Assembly of Pakistan was inaugurated, Lord Mountbatten was there to represent the, the King Emperor. And Mountbatten got up and said, now you have great leaders such as Akbar as a model to follow. Jinnah gets up and says, the role model for us is Prophet Muhammad, who first defeated the Jews and Christians and then treated them well. And then I've quoted in the book several instances. But, 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 to... but, but, how does this yeah. prove your point? And I'm quoting you. Your point is Jinnah had no clear or consistent vision or policies to offer. How do you establish no. that point? No, what I'm saying is, People who latch on the 11th August. Uh, no, but speech, we moved on. We moved beyond 11th August. Let's not get stuck on that. No, 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 no. What I'm saying is, Jinnah in Punjabi, they say, Peer Sabnu Putter Dende. When you go to a peer saying, Bless me with a child, everybody is given the promise that a son will be born. So to the secular Muslims, he said, Pakistan will be democratic and modern. To the ulama, he said, It will be an Islamic state in the best traditions established by the Prophet. And, and so once he is gone, who would finally decide Jinnah's legacy? Because there is one secular speech and none others. 
there are hundreds of speeches where he emphasizes the islamic basis of pakistan but, 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 and but, then but the point you're making professor ahmed and again we're in danger of getting lost in detail is jina said different things to different people yes as a result right. of which as a result of which you're concluding that he had no clear or consistent vision that's why you yes. come to this conclusion quite right quite right quite right okay now the second thing you make in your book is another criticism of jina you suggest that jina is responsible for the fact that liberal parliamentary democracy did not take firm root in pakistan you write and i'm quoting he arbitrarily acquired extraordinary powers as the head of state and armed with them he took some very controversial decisions which greatly weakened the chances of pakistan stabilizing as a liberal parliamentary democracy what were those extraordinary powers that he acquired and what were the controversial decisions he took first of all uh, he made mount batten agree to conferring on jena the powers to amend the 19 the 18th july 1947 independence act then on the 21st of august 1947 in less than a week or a week after pakistan came into being he ordered the governor of northwest frontier province now called khyber pakhtunkhwa sir george cunningham a hand picked governor he brought back from england told him that i have legalized the dismissal of the elected government of northwest frontier which was then headed by the congress uh, congress party under dr khan sahab the elder brother of khan abdul ghafar khan now this party had a majority in the legislative assembly and there was no law and order situation justifying the governor to impose uh, uh to dismiss the government under article 95 so this was the extraordinary powers which jena acquired and made the governor dismiss this government the second was his own uh, muslim league government of sindh headed by Uh, ayub khodo jena once again uh, arbitrarily declared that karachi will be federal territory and khodo who was a sindhi he wrote back that this is the only major city of of sindh and it should remain in sindh jena would brook no opposition and he dismissed him the third one came to haunt pakistan in a far more serious way in march 1947 47 48 march 1948 for the first and last time he went to east pakistan and in dhaka he declared i make it very clear that only urdu will be the national language of pakistan now you see 55% of the population of pakistan was bengali speaking and bengalis were not conversant in urdu at all in west pakistan of course punjabis some sindhis some pakhtuns who had gone to school could read and write urdu but they had their own mother tongues only 3% of the population of west pakistan at that time was had urdu as their mother tongue so this was imposition of a minority language on a majority population and that's when the sowed the seeds of resentment were sowed and in 71 ultimately it culminated with the breakup of pakistan in other words jinnah acquired powers not just to retrospectively amend the independence act of 1947 passed long before pakistan came into being but he also acquired powers to illegitimately to use your phrase dismiss governments because he didn't like them and also to impose what you call a minority language on the majority of the people and as a result of these extraordinary powers the possibility of pakistan becoming leave aside flourishing as a liberal parliamentary democracy that possibility was quashed that's what you're quite saying quite right quite right quite right all right professor ahmed i thank you for this interview there are many in india whose hearts will be gladdened and warmed by what you said i imagine there will be many in your own country who will be infuriated and will deeply <laughs> contest every word of your interpretations 
But that, I'm sure, is something you're aware of. I thank you for Absolutely. having made time. Thank you very much me. for this opportunity. I really enjoyed talking to you. Thank, thank you, so you much. sir. Take care. Stay safe. The same to you.